I'm the VP of Engineering at Etsy and wanted to introduce Coda Hale. Um, Coda is a infrastructure architect, is that right? At Yammer in San Francisco. Uh, we used to work with each other and um, I uh, have a lot of good things to say about Coda. I think he uh, does an amazing job of figuring things out and going off in what might be described as a cave and kind of learning about things and then coming out and saying, I have some knowledge to share with you. And he usually uses that voice too, that I have some knowledge. I have some knowledge. Exactly, thank you. So um, he, uh, he gave a great talk at uh, GitHub's CodeConf conference a year or two ago, two years ago, um, about metrics, which at Etsy we are completely sold and, and totally uh, the choir. So rather than having him give that talk again, I asked uh, him to come up with something else he wanted to talk about. He wants to talk about the other side of software architecture. Uh, so please enjoy Coda, uh, Coda's Craft with Coda Hill. Um, hi, and thanks, Mark. Uh, so I used to work for Mark, and I uh, really wouldn't be here today if it weren't for him and a whole variety of reasons. Um, I mean, one, he invited me over. So uh, the, uh, two, he also gave me, uh, in the almost four years we worked together, he gave me a lot of really good advice. Um, so uh, I've got a lot of stuff to cover. It's gonna be a little crazy. Um, so I'd appreciate it if you'll held your questions for later. I'm gonna be available afterwards. Um, I will answer all questions, et cetera. Um, so today I'm gonna be talking about two things which are actually the same thing. Um, first, why the way people work uh, affects the way that software works. Um, and then second, why the way software works affects the way that people work. Um, Mark pretty much covered this. Uh, you might have seen me on Twitter yelling about things I don't like or on GitHub working on things that I do. Um, infrastructure architect at Yammer. And uh, we actually just got recently acquired by Microsoft. Um, <laughs> so I'm, gonna, I'm still in the process of internalizing this. Um, uh, in part because I've only worked for, for small companies. I've really, in my career, I've only worked for, for startups. Um, and one thing I've noticed about startups is that there's kind of a, a there's like a creation story for startups. Um, there's a process that every single one seems to go through, and it starts with, you know, somebody has a crazy vision. They want to, uh, you know, fix personal finance, or, uh, you know, uh, it, for, for Yammer, it was, uh, you know, let, let's fix the way that people collaborate when they work. Let's, you know, uh, uh, you know bring some 21st century to the corporate world. Uh, I, when I joined, I had kind of a competing vision. It was a little bit more specific. Um, I wanted to introduce rhizomatic actor networks into what I think are overly rigid, kind of calcified uh, uh, corporate hierarchy structured around 18th century notions of command and control. But people said that wasn't punchy enough. <laughs> so something about fixing the way people work. Um, so you have your vision, and then you build a product to you know, make your vision become true. Uh, and so you, you, know, you, you come up with a specific thing. We're gonna build a you know, microblogging, and then that doesn't work, and then you try something else, and it's a little bit better, and eventually you kind of catch on to something that like, actually has some traction. And that's great. You, can, you, know, you, you get funding, you get revenue, you get you know, acquired, TechCrunch blogs about you, um, and you're off to the races. And so this is the way that most people think that you should do a startup. This is the process from vision to product to success. And it's not actually the right way of doing things because you don't actually build the product. Instead, the company builds the product and you build the company. So when you're at a startup, you're definitely building a product, but ultimately you're, you're building a company to build a product. Um, and I don't just mean like a monetization strategy or a business plan or a you know, particularly cool revenue stream. Um, I mean, you're, you're, making, you're, you're forming a group of people who are coming together to achieve some sort of common, usually economic goal. Um, and the difference between success and failure in that regard doesn't have to do with you know, business plan aspects like uh, uh, you know, like the features and virality and, and market share and monetization or technical stuff, right? Like, like, like how web scale your database is or, uh, uh, you know, like, like whether or not your programming language scales. It's, uh, you succeed or you fail based on how your company goes about building its products. Um, 
And I'm, I mean, I'm a software nerd. I got into this uh, because I really like writing uh, code. And f so for me, the big analytical tool here um, is Conway's Law, um, which is, uh, this is uh, not Ron Conway, this is Mel Conway, who was a programmer back just after programming got created. Um, and so in a 1968 paper called How Committees Event, Invent, um, he wrote the following. Um, organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations, which is to say that there's a strong relationship between the structure of the software and the organization, uh, the structure of the software that the organization builds and the structure of that organization itself. So there's a, uh, a homomorphism um, between the software and the organization. And the basic mechanism for this is actually fairly simple. Um, at the end of the day, you really can only fit so much crap in your head and you're only working 14 hours a day and then you die. Um, so you're gonna run out of your ability to reason about a particular system. The complexity of that system will escape the ability for you to keep it in your mind, even if you are smart, I believe you are smart, um, and you will run out of time to work on it, even if you are super productive, and I believe you're super productive. So at that point, you essentially have one option, which, you know, you get help. Um, so you get another person to help you work, and then you divvy up that work. You divide this system, which is either you know, too hard to work on or, or you know, too complicated to think about. You divide it up and you say, you do the sign up flow and, and I'll do the, the new help system. Um, and then that person works on that part of the code and then you work on this part of the code. And then you add another person and the work gets divvied up and then you add another person and the work gets divided further and then eventually you've got a team of people and then the team's too big to fit in the room so you've got two teams of people. Uh, because each person has a, you know, like a finite capacity for the way that they think. Um, and so the way that these people, right, even just two people or two teams or two companies, the way that they work together is gonna fall uh, uh, on a spectrum. Um, hive mind versus pen pals, um, in terms of, of how they communicate. Um, so on, on one uh, end, you've got uh, kind of the hive mind. If you and another person are in kind of a hive mind communication uh, uh, style, you're going to be living and breathing the product. You're going to be feeding each other ramen on a, on a ratty couch. You're going to be working on the same code at the same time. Uh, you know, it's wonderful. But your software is going to have that same sort of flavor. It's going to be uh, tightly coupled, it's going to have informal APIs, uh, it's going to have little to no modularity, it's not going to have much documentation, um, because quite frankly, you don't need it at that stage, it's not required, so you don't build it. Um, and, and so this end of the spectrum is where you get like a lot of early stage uh, 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 startups. Um, and it, essentially it values uh, immediate productivity over long-term maintenance costs. Um, on the other side, there's uh, uh, pen pals. So you and the other person, or those two teams, or those two companies might be separated by some you know, geography and time zones, um, organizational barriers, they may be on the ass end of the org chart from each other, um, divergent skill sets, backend engineers, mobile engineers, um, or maybe they just don't like each other. That's always been a really interesting one to watch, is when you have two engineers working on the same thing and they hate each other. And you end up with two things that don't talk to each other. Um, so, so pen pals end up being very kind of formal uh, APIs, a lot of loose coupling, a uh, lot of modularity, tons of really formal documentation. Um, because this side of the spectrum values limiting the scope of potential change uh, over achieving the actual goal at hand in kind of an immediate way. So we have the spectrum in terms of communication styles. Of, of the way that people work and the way that the, the groups of people work. Um, and it's worth noting that there's not a right way of doing this. This is very descriptive. Uh, both of these have problems because software is complicated and, you know, fuck computers. Um, but, so neither of these are correct, but it's important to know where you are in kind of this arrangement from massive tightly coupled things to, you know, uh, very distributed loosely coupled things. Um, because this is the same thing as this in the software world. If you go all the way hive mind, you're going to be building a ball of mud. Someone else who's not part of the hive mind jumps in, okay, I'll work on the, oh my God, what is this, right? It's just this massive, you know, monolith of like, okay, how does it, it just, okay, and everything knows about everything neat. Um, and if you go all the way pen pals, you're going to end up with like an explosion in your, you know, flyweight adapter dispatcher singleton factory. Um, 
Uh, I mean, personally, and not to pick on them too much, I'm sure they're nice people, but the guys who write, the people who write Spring, like, I, I really think that they communicate with postcards, right? They just write down a little thing and just, mm mm, -mm. Um, Because it's, you know, just completely and totally decoupled. Um, so Conway's law means that the, the structural uh, features and defects that you find in your software, um, they're going to resemble the features and defects you find in your uh, organizational structure. Um, and the cool thing about this, which I really like, because I really like software and I really like studying organizations, is that you can use tools from either kind of side of the fence to analyze uh, 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 how they interact. Um, so for example, uh, uh, anti-patterns. I really like anti-patterns, right? Because it's a lot better than just saying it's bad. You get to be a little specific about it. Um, so who has heard of the God object? OK, not enough. Um, so it's essentially when you, like in object-oriented programming, when you have a class which just does all the things, right? It's like it's the user model, but it renders stuff, and it sends email, and it also validates credit cards. And then, you know, like it also, you know, like it has a little Lisp kind of DSL thing for a rules engine. Um, and it, it shows up when the transaction cost of adding a piece of functionality to that particular class is greater than, perceived to be greater than, the opportunity cost of actually going in and refactoring out into kind of more composable, reasonable, single responsibility pieces. Um, likewise, the startup martyr, which I just made up, so I don't think you guys have heard it, is when you have a, a small group and you have one person who perceives that the transaction cost of just doing it themselves is less than the opportunity cost of teaching other people how to do it. So you end up with one guy in the office who, well, okay, if you need he's billing, you're going to have to talk to him. The database configuration, it, it, it's going to be, you know, uh, uh, also, you know, how do you unlock the file cabinet? Going to have to talk to Frank. Um, so uh, how many people have seen Office Space? That's better. You guys remember Milton? Leave you have my stapler. Um, Milton's dead code. Right? When you have code that doesn't get executed, when you have code that gets commented out, because it's just like, I mean, it'll work itself out. It's exactly the same thing as moving Milton to the basement and stopping his paychecks and hoping he just disappears. Um, how about lava flow? Lava flow is a good, good anti-pattern. Uh, uh, Essentially, it's when you kind of have like eruptions of best practices, and then they, go, they kind of spread all over the place, and then they solidify, and then you end up with layers, right? So you start at the top, and you're like, oh, this is really clean. It's got kind of juice, and it's got, and then you look underneath it, and you're like, okay, and that's got spring MVC. That's really weird. And you look underneath it, and you're like, oh, there's struts too, man. This is, I'm... <laughs> and then you look beneath it, and you're like, EJB2, I'm out, <laughs> right? And then underneath that, there's always some gross like servlet layer. Um, that's the same thing as what you find in a lot of organizations which attempt to re reinvent themselves along the same lines and fail to do so completely, right? So the base layer has some sort of traditional kind of like waterfall -y sort of arrangement and then you have some extreme programmers and you've got some, you know, uh, uh, scrum folks and then some agile and then, you know, you've got some, like 18 different flavors of Kanban boards littered throughout the office and everyone disagrees about what meetings are for. Um, you know, so, so you know, both the software and the organization end up being this kind of balkanized or like archipelago of fads. Um, the biggest takeaway from Conway's law is that uh, trying to build software without paying attention to uh, uh, how, pe how the people are working on it uh, uh, are doing so, it doesn't work, right? You can't, just, you can't just grab one end and have that affect the other. Um, the organization of the people making the software and the way the software uh, uh, is built comprises like a, a mutually created, interdependent, usually clusterfuck, but it's fun. Um, uh, that we need to be able to, we need, we need to be able to understand it, though, right? Like we can't just say like, well, I don't know. Um, like that doesn't allow us a lot of uh, uh, ability to affect change um, in either the software or the company. Um, so. I'm gonna do a little kind of Zay Frank thing. When I see this, um, it makes me think of this, right? Uh, organization and architecture, kind of that, that particular flow, makes me think about kind of the long-standing tension in social theory and sociology between the role of structure, which is to say kind of the broad uh, uh, cultural and social context in which we do things, and the, an agency, which is kind of this weird and irreconcilable notion that we're in charge of what we do. Um, uh, and, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's not really resolvable. And the best analytical tool that I've found in terms of thinking about how structure and agency relate um, is uh, the British sociologist Anthony Giddens.
notion of uh, structuration. So instead of thinking about culture as being kind of the top level thing, and then everyone else's actions are determined by that, or instead of thinking about culture as just kind of the sum, the arithmetic sum of everybody's actions, um, instead uh, uh, he proposes conceptualizing society as a duality of these two kind of inseparable things. Um, so culture is produced by and productive of uh, our individual actions. Um, so it, like it, it, it constrains us and it enables us as we either reproduce it or change it via our actions. Um, and so when I saw this, I was like, oh, that's really cool because software engineers actually have a name for this particular sort of thing. They're cyclical dependencies, right? And the reason why they're usually not fun is because very few people write things to take it into account. Usually you just go, no, 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 that's a loop. I won't deal with it. Um, but, uh, but if we think about kind of, if we think about this, um, uh, if we think about this kind of in, in terms of Conway's law, this has some implications as far as what we should do uh, to change software architecture and to change uh, organizational uh, uh, architecture. Um, the first is we need to abandon the notion that we have any sort of unidirectional control over either software or uh, uh, how people work together. Um, so changing your org chart might have some effects on the software and changing the software might have some effects on your org chart, but ultimately, both of these things have a certain amount of inertia, right? Software doesn't change unless we change it. And likewise, culture has its own kind of recuperative, reproductive uh, 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 processes. That's why it still exists, right? Uh, you know, that's why we can all speak the same language, mostly. Um, so if you just change the organization, the software will begin to recuperate the, uh, the, the kind of old patterns. If you just change uh, uh, the software, the org chart will reinforce those same patterns as well. Um, which means we need to use iterative processes. And I realize this is a big shock being at Etsy. He's like, what, loops? Um, so uh, there's no five-year plan that makes any sense. There's no architectural roadmap that's gonna bring you any sort of clarity here. But instead, you need to have a constant loop of action and adjustment, of changing something, and then seeing what those cascading effects are. Rinse and repeat. Um, cool. So that's a very strange way of looking at both the way people work and the way that software works. Um, but, you know, so, so, so I mean, I've, I've talked about the way that people usually get into to, to startups and, and how I think they should by focusing on the company as opposed to the product. Um, and I've talked about how we can, you know, like, like shape a little, or have better tools as far as shaping the, uh, uh, the, co the company and the product. Um, but there's still kind of a big question of what we should build. Um, and my proposal um, is I think we should build sustainable value machines. Uh, I want to build like ruthlessly efficient engines of industry, uh, which are ceaselessly, constantly, just terrifyingly outpacing, outperforming, outcompeting, and out-earning everything else, and which do so indefinitely, because from the inside, it's not grueling, it's just clean fun. Um, so how do we go about doing this, right? How do we go about creating these organizations which have this kind of ability to, to, to maintain, a, a, you know, like an incredible pace of product development in the face of people just being people and time being time? Um, well, we can't cheat. Uh, we can't, uh, uh, you don't build an ecologically dominant company these days by cheating. Um, or if you do, it is a very, very short-term thing. Um, so we, we can't ignore the, the, the kind of fundamental constraints of the systems in which we exist um, and still maintain a long-term perspective. It's the 21st century, and we need to really start building things which take into account and try to minimize the externalities. Um, so part of this is going to be uh, pacing yourself. Um, so in a, in a, in a, like a, a sustainably terrifying product organization, you, you can't build one of those on top of human misery. And any organization which asks you to accept unhappiness in exchange for money should be told in no uncertain terms to fuck all of the way off. It doesn't work, and it's a short-term con. Um, I mean, to, to, to use a metaphor, which I do all the time, habitually, um, when you sprint physically, uh, your, your body has made the decision that if you don't get away from that bear in the next minute, it doesn't matter how much lactic acid your muscles have two minutes from then, right? It might matter to the bear, but it, at that point you will be beyond carrying. Um, 
So we need to be able to, or, to sprint organizationally. That needs to be a tactic that we use. But just saying sprint all the time until you die, and then we'll just put you on the pile with the others in the heap of sorrow behind the software mines. Um, it, that, that's not a long-term strategy, right? That burns out because eventually people realize that you know uh, you're a death march machine, and they don't they don't ever come back in. Um, so sprinting should be reserved exclusively for emergencies, exclusively as a as, you know like like like, like uh, uh, as a tactic with a particular strategy in mind. And I mean, if your if your day-to-day -day existence is just sprinting constantly, you need to focus less on dealing with the the epiphenomenons and more on the ideology. You need to go upstream and fix why the bears are getting in the house, so to speak. So those are the ground rules. We need to build something which is going to deliver just a, a, a preposterous blistering pace of product innovation, um, and, was all, and which is also going to be fun to work at. Um, cool, go. Um, so I'm gonna give you two design principles that I think go a really, really, really long way towards uh, uh, kind of fulfilling this for organizations. Um, it, it's something that I've gotten um, out of working at Yammer, um, and I'm not sure if they're broadly applicable, but I wanna find out. So here they are. Um, this is basically Yammer Kool-Aid in like t-shirt form. Um, and this is, th th these are the principles that we think allow us to, to, to deliver sustainable velocity on our product st uh, uh, strategy. Um, so let's take the first one, centralized vision. Um, an organization with centralized vision has a small focused group of people who are tasked with and responsible for what the product should be. Um, and it took me a long time to actually kind of accept this because I grew up, you know, using open source and I thought cathedral and bazaar, uh, network is smartest at its edges. And it took me a long time to actually see why this made sense. Um, and there's, there's two reasons. And the first is that decision making in groups does not scale linearly. Um, and the second is that centralized uh, uh, vision can actually be more globally optimal um, and avoid a, a local optima. Right, so let's go over decision making in groups. Um, generally, when you want to make a decision at work, there is a process. You call a meeting and you get people into a room. And it doesn't have to be a physical room, it could be a chat room, uh, it could be you know, uh, 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 teleconferencing, you could do it with Skype, you could do it with email if you're particularly masochistic. Um, it doesn't matter that much. Instead, you have kind of an arena and there's N people in it and they're all kind of looking at each other expectantly. Um, step two is, is to say something, um, generally. I've had a few meetings start out with five minutes of awkward silence, but somebody eventually says something, so I'm just counting that as like an edge case and, uh, as far as latency. Um, so you say something, right? You say, I call this meeting to clarify some of the new product ideas we've had for the retro encapulator. Um, so then someone in the room, someone will probably want to respond to this. And they'll say, well, we shouldn't work on the retro encapulator. Uh, instead, you know, we really should be focusing our efforts on uh, uh, you know, revamping the reciprocating dingle arm. Um, then someone else will respond to that. <laughs> and yeah, you're in a meeting, all right. Um, and so, you know, like I think, I, I think, you know, myself, probably less than a lot of people, but still enough to, you know, uh, uh, have my fill. I've spent a lot of time in meetings where it's just, it's hour two and you're just there still talking about the stuff. Um, and so I, I recently realized that, that, that how meetings work, and specifically the duration of meetings, can be explained by a neat little mathematical model. Um, it's this. Um, so it's actually the equation for a basic viral uh, uh, model uh, for you know, user growth or, or, or what have you. Um, so I realized that the meetings are essentially have viral growth qualities. Um, so yeah, they, they are exactly the sort of tire fire that you would expect. Uh, uh, meetings are essentially Farmville or cow clicker for white collar workers, um, with exactly the same productivity benefits, mind you. Um, so and the reason for this is because the duration of a meeting is exponentially proportional to the viral coefficient, which was K in the last slide. You don't need to worry about that, but K is the product of the number of invitations that a user can send out, and the conversion rate, which is the probability that any one of them will accept the invitation, right? So in a social game or something, you know, you bug everybody on Facebook. That's the, the you know, the, the fan out of bugging is the number of invitations and the probability that they will respond to being bugged about, you know, your super awesome social game um, is C. And 
for, for, for social applications, when K goes, get, becomes greater than one, right, that's when, it's, that's called going viral. And you have, you know, wonderful, you know, like, like a, a explosion in, in the number of users and VCs take your call. Um, for meetings, it's slightly different. The invitations is basically the number of people in the room minus whoever is talking. And the conversion rate is the, the likelihood in, that, that any of them are going to respond. And uh, with meetings, when this goes over one, it's not called going viral, it's called bike shedding. And it's miserable. And the only thing that prevents meetings from being just a tire fire uh, uh, for productivity is the fact that there's a hazard function for the viral model, which means that eventually the conversion rate drops to zero because everyone's too exhausted to respond to any of the dumb shit that was just said. And, everyone, and then eventually it just kind of peters out and everyone leaves the room pale, drawn, <laughs> exhausted, sweaty. Um, so there's two implications for this. Right? The first of which is that you need to involve a lot fewer people in your meetings. Every single person that you invite, every single person that attends, is the opportunity for another response. And that opportunity for another response is a fractional percentage of another fucking response. Um, so keeping your meeting small is important. Um, you also have to have a meeting with people who are already on the same page about the vast majority of things that you're actually going to talk about, which is essentially keeping the conversion rate down if you bring strangers in and you say, okay, how are we going to build a to-do list? It's going to be incredibly, incredibly wide-ranging, infinite conversation territory, right? You will give up, you will go home, you will come back. They will still be there. You will have to put IVs on them to keep them alive. Um, instead, what you want to do is you want to have meetings only within groups that actually have gone through the kind of like forming, storming, norming stages of, of, of group formation to the point where they don't have to argue about everything. They only have to argue about literally what's on, on the agenda. And so you end up with really small meetings that take like 15 minutes, and at the end you just kind of stop talking. You're like, you want to, should we just go do it? Excellent, let's go do it. Those are the really good meetings. They exist. Um, and so these are coefficients for uh, uh, viral models. Um, this is, you know, this is the runaway. This is the bike shedding. And you can see that it's exponential. And just like this would be a mess algorithmically, it's a mess organizationally. When your decision-making apparatus takes place in exponential time, you're hosed. But if you keep your viral coefficient down, like these, your decision-making process happens in logarithmic time. right? It's just how it flops. Um, uh, so having, having centralized vision, having a small group of people actually working on the product vision, um, allows a lot of your strategic product making decisions to happen in this kind of logarithmic space as opposed to being in the complete and total slash dot-esque free-for-all territory, right? Instead, it's the, you know, the troika down here getting things done. Um, centralized uh, vision also helps you make uh, uh, better decisions. Um, it helps you avoid local optima um, because in essence, what it does is it aligns everyone's decision making in, in, in an organization uh, uh, to achieve the same goals, right? If the vision is actually, I mean, if the vision is actually shared, if you just have a bunch of people in the room calling the shots and no, nobody pays attention to them, that's never going to work for a whole variety of reasons. Um, but if everyone actually trusts the product, uh, the, the, the product decisions, and if there's actually that history, um, then everyone's going to be focused along uh, the same lines. Um, and this has some, some really interesting kind of management repercussions, right? So for example, search, or, uh, Yammer doesn't have a search team. Um, uh, instead, we have a, a team called Core Services. And Core Services is just a, a group of all of our back-end engineers, some of whom have like decades of experience with search and natural language processing, other of whom have none. But we don't have um, a search team. Uh, because to do so would mean that we would be putting those engineers on the search team uh, in a position where they'd have to choose between two things. They'd have to choose the code base that they're working on or they'd have to choose the company. And when you get engineers who focus more on the code base that they're working on than on um, how the company is doing, you get feature whisperers. Oh, well, if we, uh, if we need to add that, well, well, we'll have to go talk to so-and-so and it's their project and it's their feature and no one else really feels comfortable changing it or knows where it is or knows how to deploy it, it's probably in a screen session somewhere on a server, it hasn't crashed yet. 
Um, you know, so, so, so if somebody doesn't step on that real quick and actually get that spread out and brought out into the light of, you know, reasonable decision making, um, the feature whisperer, their value to the company will no longer be in terms of creating things, right? Shipping features, making the product better, that's not where their value is actually going to lie inside of the company, right? Instead, their value lies in controlling access to that particular thing. And that's where you get Rentier systems. Um, so this is an economic term, and basically it's any economic system in which people uh, uh, are rewarded for controlling access to something instead of uh, 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 kind of creating value and doing something for a change, right? So you've got a, you, you, need to get, you need to get a permit, but you also need to pay the bureaucrat 50 bucks to get the permit stamped. The, bur the, you know, the, the, the bureaucrat is a feature whisperer you know, for that particular uh, permit. Um, but unlike bureaucrats, engineers don't usually just you know, sit around with their feet on the desk waiting for somebody to need the database whispered to. Instead, we like to program, which leads us astray of uh, Parkinson's law. And Parkinson's law, which was an observation based, uh, you know, based off of observations of uh, British bureaucrats, um, is that work expands to fit the time allocated to doing that task, right? If you have nothing to do but clean the tub, and you have two hours in which to do it, that's going not to be a clean tub, but it's going to be a very complicatedly cleaned tub, right? There will be lotions and potions and scrubs and all sorts of things that you will involve with that, because otherwise you would spend five minutes washing the tub and then an hour and 55 minutes just staring at the, vo the existential void in your life. Um, and so, so, so what happens here is that then engineers, uh, uh, okay, so, so I interviewed somebody from a major web company. They'd been there for four years. And I usually, you know, you ask people what you've been doing, how's that been? And so they were telling me, okay, well, for the past three years, I've been working on this backend service, and it serves up the images for the toolbar browser plugin thing. I was like, okay, and what else does it do? And what else did you do? And he said, well, we, we started out with this one crazy architecture, and then we decided to change it into another one, and then, you know, we read about this other stuff, so we used that. And I'm just sitting there trying to, you know, have a poker face, because it's really rude to just start screaming incoherently in the middle of an interview. Um, but, I mean, I was talking to someone who had literally just burnt three years of their employer's, like, life, right? They just they had spent all of their time iterating on tiny, tiny little useless stuff because that's all they were ever asked to do. Oh, you're, you're in charge of this, right? And so just change after change after change after change, none of it actually delivers any value. Along these same lines, when engineers get chained to particular code bases, you see a lot of sunk cost reasoning in how people argue about the, the, the kind of the, the relative costs of change uh, uh, in the software. Um, so, I mean, if you spent six months building this thing and it's the only thing that you're responsible for, when someone proposes that it be rewritten in something way less silly or, you know, just nuked altogether, just nerfed in favor of not doing that, instead you'll, you know, you, you can't help but consider the time that you have already spent on that as a future cost. And so you'll hear a lot of people say, well, yeah, but like, why do we have to rewrite that? We already spent all this time doing it. We know how it works. And why don't we just make the feature not need that? And so you end up compromising the product because people are focusing on the code as opposed to the thing that actually makes money, rewards them, uh, uh, you know, pays for booze, uh, employs lots of other people that are fun to you know, hang out with, the thing that's actually going to be the one that executes on this broad vision for why everyone's in that room, you know, busting their wrists and their backs on computers. Um, so instead of owning a particular code base or a particular feature, at Yammer we want our engineers to own the company. And as of Monday that's gotten a little bit more complicated <laughs> because Microsoft now owns it, but they want to run us independently, so we're going to keep trying to do this. Um, right, so for each, feature, for each uh, feature that we're trying to ship at Yammer, um, we assemble an ad hoc cross-functional group, 
uh, of basically random engineers who have the kind of capabilities required to deliver that feature, right? So you get two Rails people, you get a, a JavaScript uh, front end person, you get a, a, you know, two back end people, a designer and a product manager to write it through. And what they do is they work on a product spec, which is not actually a spec, it's actually just kind of some ideas in a document about what the feature should be. And their job, their only focus until it's done is to implement that feature, iterate on it until it's really, really damn good, and then ship it. Or if it turns out to have been a terrible idea, bury it in the back with the others. <laughs> and then, you know, and then that gets fed back into the product vision to be like, mm -mm, no, we should not do that. That was, that was a bad idea. Um, so the cool thing about this is that all the decision making then is scoped to that feature. It's a product oriented decision making process instead of a code or oriented decision making process, right? Um, and that's really, 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 really valuable because you find people who are, who, I mean, engineers become really, really capable of like murdering their darlings. They, uh, uh, they, they will have written something and it turns out to be now irrelevant and they'll just be like, well, let's ship this feature, right? They're focused on shipping features. Um, you know, which is the great thing about ha having a, a centralized vision and having everyone's uh, 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 kind of decision making aligned along these product goals. Um, and like I said, this is not magic. You can't just sprinkle this on an existing company without changing their software at the same time. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the product team needs to be really open to feedbacks. They need to deliberately include diverse opinions and analyses of how they're doing because otherwise you're going to get an information cascade. You're going to get echo chambers in which you've got a little group and they're off in the room and they're doing something and it doesn't work, right? They also need to be empirical. When they fail, and they will fail, when they fail, they need to know that they have failed, find out why they failed, and come up with a good way of preventing that future failure. Um, so it's not, you know, foolproof, but I think that there's a lot of value in analyzing this particular model for products, for, for building product oriented, uh, organizations that write software. Um, so centralized vision, everyone's on the same page, uh, uh aligned decision making, rah, 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 rah. Now what? Um, decentralized execution. So when it comes to software, one of the greatest critiques that you can throw at a particular software project is that, oh, it doesn't scale. It's insufficiently web scale for my tastes. No. So scaling horizontally is this really kind of like, like, like critical quality that we all, you know, like, like we need to have it. I don't know what it is, but I gotta have it. Um, I mean, essentially what it means is that as you incrementally add resources, you incrementally gain capacity, which strikes me as a really good thing because it means it's not a black box of like, fixed capabilities, and then when it's done, you just, mm, yeah, I don't know what you do. Um, so we like horizontally scalable software. What about like horizontally scalable organizations? Where, you know, you just add a person and you ship more stuff. And it's funny because when you, when, when you suggest that you can just throw computers at a particular problem, right? When you just say, oh, no, 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 we'll just add servers, man, it's fine. Um, people buy that. People totally believe that, right? That seems really plausible. When you say, like, okay, well, well, you know, this project's, you know, this project's running late, we'll just throw more people at it, right? Everyone jumps up and is like, oh, Mythical Man Month, Fred Books, uh, nine months to a baby, nine women, no. Like, no, 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 you can't do that. And it's funny because they're right in the second case and they're really optimistic about how software and computers work um, in the first case. Um, so yes, when you add someone to a project, or when you add additional com like computational capability to uh, uh, you know, solving a particular problem, um, you do get more stuff, but there's a transactional cost associated with it. And this is kind of the theme of the talk, but there's a neat little mathematical model for how that works too, called Amidal's Law. So this is Gene Amidal who designed massively parallel supercomputers, brain the size of a planet, et cetera, and it basically explains both why adding CPU cores and adding people doesn't necessarily help you at all. Um, looks like this. Uh, this is the uh, 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 expected speed up given an algorithm which, has, which is P percent parallelizable and you're giving it X more CPUs. 
And here's the, the, uh, the expected speed up for, you can't see some of them, but uh, for uh, 10 different um, uh, uh, algorithms, one of which is 90% parallelizable, right? So that's some huge like fan out and count a bunch of words that you already have and then come back in and let me know how many, how many of them there, there were, right? And then down here you've got 10%, which is basically like, I don't even know. You shouldn't throw threads or processors or people at that. Um, you know, so, so up here at the top, you can see, this is really great because you can add resources and you gain a massive amount of, of, of capacity. Um, serial algorithms you probably shouldn't throw CPUs at. That's probably not going to help. Um, but most importantly, there's a particular, like it asymptotically approaches uh, one divided by one minus P which is not super important, but it means that there's a finite ceiling of how fast you can get um, a, a, of the speed up associated by, by adding processors. Um, and because no algorithm can be 100% parallel, um, if it was, you wouldn't care about the results, right? Like, like, I mean, turning servers into space heaters can probably be considered a parallel uh, 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 problem, but eventually you want them to come back and tell you something. Um, so for algorithms, the imperative here is first to maximize the amount of parallelizability, right? So you're up there and not screwed down here. Um, and then two, to optimize the performance of the part that you can't parallelize, right? That's how you make, you know, like, 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 like HPC work. Um, so if this is the case for computers, what does this mean for organizations? Well. First, Amidal's law means that giving your engineers the trust and autonomy required for them to solve hard, meaningful problems is not a sign of trust, it's not a, a token of respect, it's not a job perk, but instead it is a critical, fundamental, required attribute of a good product organization. Um, every single piece of process which makes your engineers need to coordinate. Everything that makes them wait on somebody else, everything that makes them, uh, you know, sit down, oh, we gotta wait for the thing review, and then we gotta do the thing, and then we, you know, the manager's gonna come by and check things out. Um, all of those things are a hindrance to the existence of your organization as a really kind of high capacity product organization. Every single piece of process needs to fight for its existence. That needs to be, you know, the cork that keeps the water out and not just what I think might be a neat way of doing things. So, the other side of software architecture is obviously organizational architecture. It's figuring out how people work, it's figuring out the various dynamics and the various kind of constraints placed on uh, uh, human cooperation. Um, so Conway's law makes the case that we will see these parallels, we'll see these homomorphisms between the software that we care a lot about in between the organization, which we really probably don't care that much about. Your manager cares somewhat about it. Your manager wishes you were easier to deal with. Your manager wishes, you know, um, a lot of things. Your manager's not going to get it. Um, but if, we're, if, if you're going to build a company, you need to be focusing on, yeah, how you organize that company. So, Two pieces of advice, man. Centralize the vision. Make sure that you've got a small group of people who are on the same page, who understand what they're doing, who are open to new ideas, who are empirical. They'll have small meetings. They'll make decisions very quickly. They'll make incredibly far, like, 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 like grandiose, crazy decisions incredibly quickly. And if they're doing it right, um, it means that you will have like years lead time on your competitors. Um, it involves a lot of trust and it involves that they do it right. Um, the other part of this is decentralizing execution, which essentially means giving your engineers free reign to be the crazy code shippers that you know that they are. And if you don't know that they are, you need to give them the opportunity or improve your hiring practices. Um, so by, by reducing the amount of time that they spend dealing with management, by reducing the amount of time that they spend uh, uh, waiting for things. Every single handoff, every single handoff is like a synchronization point, right? It's like a lock on a, on, on a data structure that's being accessed by hundreds of threads, and you wouldn't do it with a computer, and you really shouldn't do it with a company. 
So um, build a company. Don't focus on the, the code. Don't even necessarily focus on the product. But you need to have this kind of meta programming skill um, where you think about how to get people to build the things. And you'll be a better product-facing organization, for sure. Um, you'll also be a better startup, because the more agility that you have at these kind of, like, kind of metacognitive levels, the better you're going to be able to survive the ups and downs of uh, uh, the startup world. Um, and you can't do it as a short-term con. You can't, do it, you can't do it to flip it. You can't do it just to you know, sell it right back to, to, to Google and get out. You can't build it on top of miserable people, because miserable people will just, they, I mean, they know they're miserable, and they'll, they'll try to get it out of you. Uh, the people at your company need to have meaningful work. They need to have that buy-in. They need to have that faith. Um, and it doesn't work unless they have that. That's what you get from kind of consensus-based decision-making processes, which really works if you're a Quaker and you're actually going to sit and you're going to prey on it for 10 minutes before you jump in, right? But if you're a bunch of know-it-all programmers, it's exponential bike shedding. Um, thanks. Um,